In this video, we will go through the process of deriving the basis vectors in an arbitrary coordinate system, and then look at how these basis vectors are related to the metric for the space. So let's start with a coordinate transformation from one coordinate system to another. That is the x1, x2, x3 coordinates to be y1, y2, y3 coordinates. An example of this would be Cartesian coordinates x, y, z, transforming to spherical polar coordinates r, theta, phi. We assume these transformations are continuous, one-to-one, -one, and possess an inverse. So here's the x1, x2, x3 coordinates, written in terms of the y1, y2, y3 coordinates, and vice versa, y1, y2, y3 coordinates, written in terms of the x1, x2, x3 coordinates. Let's start with a new position vector as a function of the new coordinate system y1, y2, y3. Here we are. And we can generate new coordinate curves or axes in the form of the position vector allowing y1 to vary by holding y2 and y3 constant. That's what the C2 and C3 stand for, constants. And that gives us this coordinate curve here, actually, this one right here. There it is. That gives us that coordinate curve. Varying y2 but holding y1 and y3 constant gives us the next coordinate curve. And this one here, varying y1, uh, holding y1 and y2 constant, sorry, and varying y3 gives us this coordinate curve here. Coordinate surfaces intersect along each of these coordinate curves, and they're given by holding y1 constant. So all values for which y1 is equal to this constant will give us this surface here. Uh, y2 and y3 can be found similarly, but only one coordinate surface is shown on this diagram, so it's not to clutter it up too much. An outward positively oriented normal is pointing this way, showing you the positive direction the surface is oriented in. <clears throat> and that's this surface here in blue. Right. And that's our first coordinate surface by holding the y1 coordinate constant. We can form new basis vectors by calculating the derivative of the position vector along each of the coordinate curves. So our first basis vector, this one here, dr dy1, pointing in this direction, dr dy2 in this direction, dr dy3 in this direction. These three vectors shown in red here form a basis for this space. They span the space. They're not necessarily of unit length. Um, <clears throat> but they form a basis for our space. There's also another basis we can form using the coordinate surfaces, and that's these vectors here. Del operator, Nabla operator, del y1, del y2, del y3, and this vector here for this coordinate surface shown, del y1, there's three of these for each coordinate surface, which are not able to fit on the diagram without cluttering it up too much. And so there's three coordinate surfaces, and there's three basis vectors formed by each of these uh, surface vectors here, normal to the surface. These are normal to the surface, and they're found by taking the del operator of each coordinate. We now have two coordinate bases. The co covariant basis, composed of the tangent vectors, they were tangent to the coordinate curves, here they are. Look at the subscript. 2, 3, and 1, numbering them. Then the contravariant basis, composed of the vectors that are normal to the coordinate surfaces. And notice the upper index here, labeling each of these. All right. So let's have a look at how these basis vectors are related to each other. All right. The differential of position vector is given by this. And it's the derivative of the coordinate curves here, this bit here. And the differentials of a scalar function of a single variable, df of x is df dx dx, but for a function of many variables, the del operator comes into play, and that's the general expression for this. So let's apply this to our the first of our coordinate transformations. We get dy1 is del of yi dot dr. Writing that out, del of y1, which we know to be one of the contravariant basis vectors. And these are the individual tangent or covariant basis vectors here. Now 
del y1, as we saw earlier, was e contravariant subscript 1 dotted with each of these lower indices basis vectors, numbered but with lower indices. Now, what we're trying to do here is we equate the left-hand side with the right-hand side, which means all these terms here have to drop off to zero. dy1, dy2, dy3 are arbitrary, so that must mean that e1 contravariant dotted with e2 covariant is zero, and so must this here be. This expression here must be zero. Only this bit is left, so e1 dotted with e1 must be one, um, because the left-hand side must equal the right-hand side. So equating coefficients, we say this is one and these are zero. And that's shown next page, here we are. So equating like terms, we see that e contravariant one dotted with e covariant one, upper index, lower index is one, and the others are zero. If we were to apply this to all the other coordinate transformations, we'll get this general result that E contravariant I dotted with E covariant J will be the Kronecker delta IJ. Um, this is 1 when I equals J and 0 otherwise when I does not equal J. So the contravariant basis vectors form the dual basis or co-basis or reciprocal basis to the covariant basis vectors. And the Kronecker delta shows that the contravariant basis vectors are perpendicular to the covariant basis at any single given point when I does not equal J. Right, these two types of vectors undergo a transformation from one coordinate system to another in different ways. So for this coordinate transformation we've been looking at earlier, a contravariant vector will transform according to this rule. Remember a vector is a tensor of rank 1, and so this is the tensor transformation law. A covariant vector will transform according to the rule, which is the opposite of the contravariant. Contravariant is so named because it, tra it tra uh, transforms contrary to the covariant basis. And we'll see a little bit later what that looks like. Notice these transformations are the opposite of each other. All right, length or magnitude in this space. So the basis vectors are a source of information about the length or magnitudes of vectors in this space. So ds squared. Um, uh, is dr dot dr is the product of these this object here, and what we do is take out the increments here, factorise them out, and we're left with dr dy dot dr dyj. This here is given the term gij, g subscript ij, and the, this term is called the metric tensor for the space, and it encodes information about the geometry of that space. So ds squared is the metric tensor times dy i dy j, or ds is just the square root of that. So let's use the metric to select an element of length in one direction L1 and then in another direction L2. So if we just go in one direction, in the, uh, in the y1 direction only, then an increment of length in this direction will be from this metric, this object here, Remember that's ds, so ds in the y1 direction is l1, is just this object here. Uh, this squared term comes out as dy1. In the y2 direction, then an increment of length ds in the y2 direction gives us this object here, which comes out to be this. And this gives us an element of area dA in this space, is l1 by l2, is these objects multiplied together, which is just this object here. An element of volume, likewise, is just the increments in each of the three directions multiplied together as an increment of volume, dB, that gives us this object here. In higher dimensions, these can be generalised too. For instance, in n dimensions, the volume element becomes this, and likewise the area would also uh, just be this, but um, with the terms right up to GNN, similar to volume. All right. Interestingly, any vector can be written in terms of either set of basis vectors. So some vector v, whatever it is, whatever quantity we're interested in, can be written with components, with contravariant components and covariant tangent basis vectors, or with covariant components and contravariant uh, basis vectors, which is the surface normals again. Right. Now the metric has an important role in raising and lowering of the indices of the components of tensors, of which a vector is a rank 1 tensor. So this metric here takes this index, the i, 
and the I, the Einstein summation convention comes into play here, sums these two out and lowers the index to J. So we get V covariant J. So we take in contravariant uh, um, vector, co vector components with uh, contravariant vector components, that is, sorry, and transfer them into covariant vector components. Likewise, we can raise indices with the inverse metric tensor. And the I's sum out here, Einstein summation convention, and we're left with a J component. And so we turn that into VJ. Now the metric tensor and its inverse are related by, so here's the metric tensor, and here's the inverse metric tensor, and they're related by the Kronecker delta. Again, the K's sum out, and we're left with a J up top, the I below. Uh, now these things are zero when J does not equal I, and they're equal to unity when J equals I. All right, scalar product, u dot v. So express u in this form, contravariant uh, components, covariant basis, contravariant components, covariant basis. There we go. That gives us the metric tensor times these two contravariant components. Or we could go um, covariant components, contravariant basis together, and we get the inverse metric and we get covariant components. U dot V can be done this way as well. Now here, covariant basis, contravariant basis, and the Kronecker delta here will apply as we saw earlier, and that will give us these components. Four different ways of getting the scalar product. Again, similar method here. Contravariant and covariant basis vectors, Scalar product of them, again Kronecker delta applies, and the same object is produced. The norm of a vector, modulus, usual form here, which now can be any one of these forms here, as you can see here, like that, and they all give us the norm of the vector u. The angle between two vectors, conventional usual form we're used to in vector calculus, there it is. Now, in this using the metric, we get these objects here. All right, norm of u, the norm of v, u dot v, the scalar product, here we go. All right, now let's imagine some curve y of tau. Tau is the parameter, and each of the coordinates are parameterized in terms of the variable tau. It might be in general relativity, it might be the proper time experienced by a particle that carries its own clock with it. The length traveled by this object along this curve between tau 1 and tau 2 is this object here. All right. Now let's have a look at some normal vectors. For a given surface, u equals constant. A normal vector to the surface is given by here. If we now want to see a unit normal to the same surface, that's given here. We just need the norm of this object up here, del u. There it is. So that's a unit vector to the same surface, unit normal vector perpendicular to the surface. The cross product of two vectors is given by u cross v, this object here. Factorize out the components, u, j, v, k. Here we are. That's the vector w. Now dot that with e subscript i, covariant i. And we get this object here which is epsilon i, j, k, u, j, v, k is w, i. That's the components. By using dotting vector w with e, i, we get the components. And the vector w can be double the components w, i times the contravariant basis e, i. So we can express the vector that is the cross product of these two vectors in this form here. Now epsilon i, j, k is the permutation tensor. And the permutation tensor has the following properties in its covariant or contravariant form. Uh, plus one for an even permutation of the integers that form ijk, whatever they are. Minus one for an odd permutation of the integers, ijk. And zero if two or more indices are equal. And that's the permutation tensor.